That's a nice beat. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome once again to Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka. And boy, am I excited about our guest today because I have none other than Gerald Leonard with the Leonard Productivity. No. Productivity Intelligence Institute. Sorry, I thought I'd screwed it up there, Jerry. No, 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 you're, you're right. It, it, is, it actually is Leonard Productivity Intelligence Institute. The website is just Productivity Intelligence Institute. And I'm also the CEO of Turnberry Premier. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I'm so excited about having you here today, Gerald, just because I'm going through your stuff, man, your, your background and what you're helping people do in our conversation before we came live here. Yeah. So much cool stuff. So we always like to start out the show the same way. Okay. So let's let's start back a ways and kind of tell us about how did Gerald go from Gerald who got out of high school into Gerald that's helping people, you know, develop these building these sustainable teams, high performing teams, showing people how to run really successful businesses. Well, man, it started off uh, right behind me. I'm going to go this way. There's a red guitar. When I was yep. 10 years old, that actually belonged to my sister. And I was learning how to play piano, but I didn't like it <laughs> at the time. And nice. so I would sneak in her room and grab that thing and start playing. And I got really pretty good, and she realized that she wasn't going to use it, so she let me have it. And I started playing it, and I joined the band with some friends, and one of them was an amazing guitar player, so I knew I got to find something else to play. So I started playing bass because I'd already built the chops to play the strings. And so I became that's how I became the bass player. Okay. And it was also at the time, in I'll give away my age, in 1974, where in Lakeland, Florida, the central states in, in central Florida, they created the Lakeland Civic Center. And what happened was all these bands came in town, the Commodores, Earth, Wind and Fire, all these major bands. And it wasn't like these two thousand dollar tickets. Yeah. I could mow a lawn and go to a concert. Oh, my so goodness. I, I just watched everybody. I was so inspired. I played and practiced all the time, went to college for music. And that's a whole nother story of how that all happened. But I did my bachelor's and master's in music. I went to Central, uh, Central State University, under uh, the HBCU, and then I went down to Cincinnati Conservatory because of some of the coaches I had around me got me to the level while I was still at Central State. I started playing for the Springfield Symphony as, wow. a, as a professional, and then I got to work with Frank Proto at the, at, um, the uh, Cincinnati Conservatory. And then when I left there, I moved to New York, and his teacher, David Walter, who was the basis for Toscanini, became my teacher for one year. And then I stayed in New York and played. And then I went into the ministry. So for six to seven years, I did ministry work and played music at the same time. And after we been married, having some kids, I thought, you know, I really want to go back into music. But having kids, that's how I got into IT. Because I was yeah. playing music and I didn't want to play these swanky clubs. I wanted to play nice places, you know, uh, shows and workshops and different things like that. And so I started doing IT consulting. I'd learned about computers and started reading everything I could. I'm an avid reader. And in a short period of time, I was a full-fledged consultant and playing music. And I've done that all my life. And so wow. how did I get to be where I'm at now is over those almost 30 years, let's say 25 plus years of playing music all the time and doing consulting, you start seeing similarities. And when you do a really great show, musicians come in, they got a woodshed, you got to practice, you got to have a mentor and a coach, you have to learn to work together. One of the things you learn as a musician is you have to listen, you really have to listen really carefully to everyone else, because you got to make sure one, you're in tune, and one that you are playing with everyone else, and you need to understand the big picture of what's happening. I started going to some of my clients and seeing projects where we were doing some great work with like, say, the National Archives or Pfizer, or some other places like that. And everyone came in and they knew their stuff. But mm -hmm. when we talked, looked at the charter and the requirements, we got the big picture. We had a great sponsor. And so we started kind of like improvising. Hey, this is this is your section of the project because we're designing work. So now, you know, it's the it's the requirements guy. It's the business analyst who's writing the report. Everyone's supporting him. It's like soloing in a jazz band. Yeah. 
developers take over and they start building the software. Well, that's their solo, they're soloing. So everyone around them begins to support them. The project managers, he's basically treating everyone like an artist. They know their stuff, let them do their work, guide them, give them input, help them out to make it work. Yeah. And so what I've done over the years, once I've kind of got codified all of that, is I started putting it into books. My first book was called Culture is the Base because business culture is a feel. I mean, think yeah. about it. When you walk into Nordstrom or some great store you love, you feel like, oh, I, I just like the vibe here. It's like, it's, mm -hmm. you know, they take care of you. I like the way they put the shoes up. It's a vibe. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. Yep. So my next book was called Workplace Jazz. It's all about agile teams. So what's a great example of an agile team? A quartet, a trio, a quintet, yeah. Yeah. right? They're playing all this fast music. They got to listen to each other. It's all... What happens when you do agile work? It's moving every day. You're meeting. The requirements are changing. You got to make things happen. It's like playing jazz. Mm -hmm. And in a symphony of choices, the one I just released, it's actually a business novel because one of the books that inspired me the most, and I was doing some work for I think it was Freddie Mac at the time. That was when I was living in the D.C. area. My companies are still there. I actually live in Spanish Fort, Alabama, so I'm down in the sun. Nice. I get to see the water and everything else. So I'm enjoying. Yeah. It. Yeah. But yeah. what was inspiring is that listening to the gold. It was basically like watching a, um, it was like, it was like listening to television and you couldn't see the movie. So you had to visualize everything, but yeah. he took you through this, this story to teach you the complexity of the theory of constraints. Well, I ended up studying with D Jacob at the Goldrand Institute and I got certified in portfolio management in the theory of constraints. So I teach that nice. all the time in my business, but I knew that those complex concepts are best taught through stories. And that's why a symphony of choices is a business novel and a story. So that's how I became who I became. It was all the lessons I learned as a 10 year old playing music. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I saw that in your background that you had, you had gone to uh, the gold rat Institute and, and studied there. And that's, that to me is still one of the Bibles for uh, out of, well, first of all, in any business, it came yeah. to me in manufacturing because it's yes. so, you know, it's written in that, that tune, that kind of setting, right. but it's, it's how that relates to absolutely everything is, is pretty incredible. Any, anything yeah. that's got a process, any business, um, and the things you're looking at. So it's so <laughs> that, and, and the way that you, you, um, tie, how music works with business and teams is is really interesting because it is like that when you walk into a business and it's just you feel the vibe i yep. like culture is the base because you know you know the you looking in, in listening to music if that bass is good you know it's going to be exactly. and based on what the bass is doing you know exactly the genre and the style of music yep yep well i mean you go go into a jazz club and listen yep. to a three-piece band someone's playing the bass well you you can tell if you're going to like it and want to be there or not exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and that's that's so cool and then when you talk about you talk about workplace jazz and agile teams and you you relate it to a, an ensemble of a three four four people i mean it's just like you said to be agile you have to be cognizant of your, cognizant of your surroundings and how things are changing and react and and really flow with it exactly it's so cool so cool. So in your latest book, and I didn't realize you just released it on Tuesday. So that's super cool. Yes. Um, that we, we got this time like this. What really made you combine all this stuff into more of the symphony of choices and, and what you're trying to sell in a story format? Yeah, well, I think we were talking earlier and, you know, a lot of businesses struggle with and they don't really put a name to it, but it's basically they struggle with executive decision making or portfolio management. And basically they struggle with how do I select the activities that will run the business while at the same time doing projects that will help me grow my business, even reduce expenses or increase revenue in different ways because you know that's you're, yep. you're growing the business by growing the profits of the business doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're adding count or new products you're just tweaking and optimizing the system but while you're doing that 
you also have to transform the business looking for the next thing. So you always have to be doing that. You always have to be looking at it. And so the, all of those things come together and it's really around what's called project portfolio management. And in 2015, before I wrote my books, I already had the what's called the PMP or the Project Professional Certification. I did that mm -hmm. in 2005. And I had done a lot of consulting, a lot of work. And I'd gone up the ladder and done the program management work. And I started doing the portfolio level work where you're working with the C-suite, you're working with managing director, executives, VPs, and you're helping mm -hmm. them work at projects and weigh projects and you're managing budgets. One of my last clients was a department of transportation where they brought me in and we were dealing with 14,000 projects in a $16 billion budget. And so, you know, it gets really big and hairy yeah. when you have that. So you have to have those buckets or the containers. And so having written a class in 2015 around that, I wrote the class so I could take the certification because at that point in the time, there wasn't a lot of material out there. And so mm -hmm. I wrote put together a class, made sure it was aligned to the PMI standard for the PMP certification. And that's one of the certifications on the wall behind me. And plus you have to have 10 years of experience to even sit for the certification. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was to teach people those concepts. I looked out in the market. There's a lot of books on portfolio management and you put them beside your bed at night when you can't sleep and you pick them up <laughs> you start yeah. and, then, and yeah. there, there you go you fall asleep and it's not any i'm not knocking any of those books if you're a deep if you're a detailed practitioner you love them they're going to keep you awake but mm -hmm. if you're a business person and you don't want to become an expert in portfolio management you just want to run your business better they will put you to sleep yeah so i wanted to write a book like the goal or like the book uh, it's called built to sell um, yep. I don't remember the name of the author, but I, I remember listening to the book and reading the book. Yep. And it's a story. And I love the built to sell because at the end of the chapters, he would always say, here's what the mentor taught me. So when I wrote my book, I, you know, I, I actually work with a, a gentleman who was a really good fiction writer because I'm a nonfiction writer. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to work with someone who's really good at storytelling. It was my stories. We all worked together. We shaped it. But he actually happened to be a musician and an orchestra manager. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. I was an orchestra bass player. Yes. So quintessential, I'm playing two roles in the book, you know, in fiction, which is Jerry Hall. And that's a whole other thing that I can tell you about that one, because um, he's playing bass for 20 years in our symphony. But then you to become the orchestra manager. And then you have Dr. Carl Richardson, who basically is a professor teaching these concepts of portfolio management. So basically, he starts teaching Jerry these concepts, starts spoon feeding him this concepts. Mm -hmm. And now Jerry has some challenges. His wife doesn't like his job. His, his, his older daughter is being an older daughter, a teenager. Yeah. His son, his, now, his son is, is, is kind of cool because he's playing bass and he wants to be like dad. Um, his boss, the, the, the conductor, is, is a prima donna. Him and his boss get along pretty well. But so he has some challenges in life. Yeah. As we all. That we all do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how best to teach a really difficult, complex concept through a story? Yeah. Where right. you can literally sit beside Jerry as he's going through the process and playing music. And all of us, you know, the idea of a symphony is that's my that's my playground. That music is mm -hmm. my playground. So I, you know, having grown through that all my life. You know, there's so many stories I have about conductors and music and how music impacts you. And I'll tell you this, um, music has has healing properties. And I'll share this story later uh, about something that happened to me with my, with uh, vertigo and vest vestibular I issue that I still have. I call it a constraint, not a disability. Because of what I learned from the theory of constraints. And I'll tell you how that made an impact on me. But with the book, I wanted people to be able to get the concepts without feeling like they were reading a technical book about yeah. portfolio management. So it's decision-making, project management, and workplace engagement, and how mentorship taught. Because I believe mentorship is like, find, when you find the right mentor, it's like getting on the HOV lane. Yeah. Right? Yep. You're stuck in traffic, and you're in the car by yourself, and you just see people going, zoom, zoom. <laughs> it's like, <Yeah. laughs> there's always two people in that car. There's never yeah. one person. Yeah. And our great. careers and business life and personal lives are the same way. 
if we find the right mentor, and I look at mentors as being people who are tour guides, not just not a not the tour guide who who just sits out and hands you the brochure, but mm -hmm. the tour guide who's actually been at the top of the mountain, been down in the valley, been through the canyon many times, and he can say, "Oh, stop here." Around this time, look over there. You're going to see this. He's going to show you all these things that you never would even imagine to see because he's been there, done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And you're exactly right. You know, And how our minds work is if we don't have that mentor alongside of us saying, hey, you probably want to look over here at this. We won't even see it. We're just going to go right by. Exactly. Because, the, you know, here's something from one of my coaches and mentors who's into neuroscience, and I've done a certification in neuroscience as well, is that our brains only see about process about 7% of everything around us. However, our non-conscious mind sees it all. We're just not aware of it. Yeah. And so there are techniques and processes that I've learned from my coaches and mentors of how do I tap into my non-conscious mind so that I can expand the capabilities of my conscious mind so that I can ask myself a question, a problem I'm dealing with, go do something else and let my non-conscious work on it and then come back and meditate and focus. And my non-conscious says, oh, here's the answer to this problem you've been working on all day. Or I'm going to lead you to this person who can help you with that, that answer. Yeah. And so it's really so that's why my 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 podcast and that website is called Productivity Intelligence or Productivity Smart. Yeah. Because it's about leveraging, you know, what I've done is leverage the science of principles of music, uh, neuroscience, productivity, project program, portfolio management, and workplace engagement and culture. Yeah. Well, it's the way you have combined those is incredible because I was enthralled when I got on your website and just looked at the different ways that you're looking at productivity and now being able to talk with you. And, and before we got on today, it's, it's so interesting because the kind of work, I love how you've got this curious mind because you couldn't do what you're doing without having a, an extremely curious mind, you know, all yeah. the way back from learning music and, and, and learning how to play as a young uh, a, a youngster um, until today. I mean, if this I was, we were commenting on, look at how many different certifications you've got and all these different things to be able to help, help really shape. And then you, you start talking about tapping into your non-conscious mind uh, to help solve problems. I mean, wow, you're just, it's, this is over the top. So I got so many things to ask you. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's great. I'm super excited here, man, because you know, we, we, we talk about so many things. We, you know, everybody's under the gun. They want to get more productivity. They want to be, want to be better doing what they, what they're doing. And, you know, you talk about revolutionizing the way we approach maximizing our potential. Yeah. I, I, I read that on, on some of your stuff. I can see why you, you a can do that and be that like you love to talk about it. So let's talk about that a little bit, because I think we're at an interesting point in time because the whole AI thing, and we'll talk about that and you talk about that a, a, a bit on, on your stuff. Yeah. And then just, some of the basic fundamentals that you brought up here about tapping in a non-conscious mind yeah. and how this whole thing might meld together in the, in the near future to really make a huge difference in productivity. Exactly. Exactly. Because here's the thing. Productivity is not about um, working endless hours. It's not about an 80 hour work week. It's not about, because what you're going to do is you're going to burn yourself out. And also, you know, one of the things that's on my heart that I really, and I mean this from a just just being authentic, hopefully, as I'm as I'm sharing this, because I really want to create a platform or or a program that can really help artists. Because it hurts when you see a really talented artist like Prince or Michael Jackson or one of these guys, who they they get to the pinnacle of the career, and then they explode. Yeah. Right. It's either drugs or it's either yeah. alcohol or it's either just they're just running themselves ragged because yeah. as you go up the ladder, it gets, you know, it's like, OK, you're successful, successful, successful. But then it becomes more difficult 
you have less personal time and they don't know how to put guardrails around it. And so, and when we, we talk about, you gotta be more productive, more productive, more productive, we can do that to each other. And, and we can, we can do that to business owners. We can, you know, the, the, the analysts do it to court to the fortune 500s. This is what the stock should be. Oh, it didn't make it. Oh, now we're going to be, we're going to ding your stock price because you didn't meet what we said you should do. That yeah. makes no sense to me. Right. So what I've learned in working with Jack Canfield, a lady named Dr. Bobby Stevens, Dr. Paul Sh- uh, uh, Shilly, is you have to take a holistic approach and realize we are human beings, not human doings. So mm-hmm. I've learned my routine. So I'll just share my routine in the morning. I get up around 530 and for first 45 minutes or let's say first 15, 20 minutes, I do yoga. I just do, I just stretch because what I learned is that our physical bodies will maintain and take on every stressful thing that we experience. And if we're not constantly wrenching out the, you know, wringing out the body, re- getting rid of that stress and, and, and just dealing with that, then we end up with the pain in the neck and we're this, and this is turned and all those things. And what, you know, and I know that personally because my vestibular challenge a, a major vertigo incident that I had in 2018 uh, happened because of stress. And I had to learn, okay, I need to get myself in a place where I'm at peace. But what I do is I do the yoga. I'll do five minutes of deep breathing. I, I follow, I'm, in, I'm into heart math, where it's about how to get coherent, where your heart and your brain are in coherence. Nice. And then I'll do some exercise. And then I'll spend about 30 minutes writing out my goals, just listening to meditative music and what, what Dr. Shilly calls paralimals, but, and I'll write out my goals by hand and it forces my reticular activating system to really hone in on what I want in my life. Then I start my day. I don't turn on the news first thing. I don't do all this. I work on me first. That puts yeah. me in a calm state, rings out the body, gets my mindset for what I want to do. And then I then one of the things that Jack Canfield says is find five things a day that you can work on that's going to move your business forward. Now, sometimes I can only get to one of them. Sometimes I can get to mm-hmm. two of them. Sometimes I can get to all five. And then I'll just rewrite the list. I only, so I only focus on five major tasks a day. And I kind of have my meetings and podcasts and the different things I'm working on. And by doing that, and learning to take breaks, I use something called the Pomodoro technique. I use something yeah. like that. I have these on my website. And basically, if I'm working on something, I'll say, this is the task I'm working on, single task, or I'll do task batching, which is tasks that are all related to each other. And then I'll set the clock and I'll work for 20, 25, 30 minutes. Then I'll take a 10 minute break, a five minute break, a 15 minute mm-hmm. break. Sometimes I'll stop and I'll play piano or I'll play my bass. Or I'll run an errand. I'll walk outside and do something in the garden. And then I'll come back. Okay, what's my next task? And if I have a lot of things going on, because I have this vestibular issue, I will I will make sure my day is available where I can take a nap for thirty minutes. So I'm so that I'm re-energized for the yeah. afternoon activities. And so I'll just I'll just share this because in 2018. You know, I was in my first marriage. I I, I went through a divorce, got remarried, and I was under a lot of stress from different situations. You know, it wasn't just work. I always enjoyed my work, um, playing music or whatever. But I was in a place where it was a lot of stress. And at a workshop, the vertigo happened. The room spinning really bad. I had to, a doctor have to, had to come in. I won't go into all the details. Had to come in. He's like, we got to take this guy by ambulance to a hospital. I was an hour and a half away from my home where I was living in Maryland. I get there. My eyes are going like this. They had to give me a shot to make it stop. They kept me overnight. And they're like, "That's this is not normal vertigo. We got to recommend you to a specialist. Um, can you, we, we, We're going to have to give you a walker. You got to show us that you can walk down the hall with the walker to let, for us to let you go home. So I lost, uh, because I had my vestibular uh, impact, I lost the ability to walk. Wow. Now, the funny thing about this, and it's really not funny, it's funny now, or it's interesting now, is that all this happened six weeks before I was to deliver a TEDx talk that I had been approved to deliver. Wow. 
So I so I go home. I'm an independent consultant. I'm a 1099. No laptop, no work, no pay. And I'm sitting there feeling like I'm in bed. I can't watch TV. I can't look at my laptop. And I'm thinking, is this my life? What in the world happened? Yeah. And at the same time, I'm thinking about my TEDx talk. And as I'm dealing with life and all the challenges that are going on there, my talk was, and if it's on the TEDx platform, it's called, um, what if practice is the performance? What if, because professionals are only on stage 5% of the time of their career. Yep. So what's the, what are they doing the rest of the time? They have to practice. So if you don't love practicing, you're going to, you're going to be miserable. But it was the neural, but I talked about the neural science of music. And as I'm rehearsing my talk in my head, it was a quote from, I don't remember the book, but basically uh, I'll just kind of sum it up. It was basically, if you have an issue or a block or, or some brain issues and you're playing music, the brain will work around that and start rewire, it will rewire itself. So I'm thinking, okay, as soon as I could sit up, I'm going to make it to my office, which was next door to my bedroom at the time. And I'm going to grab my bass and play. So I did. And I did it every day. And I got, I mean, literally I'm, I'm holding onto the walls to get mm-hmm. to my office, sit down, play. The next morning I felt better. I did a little bit more. I'm slowly walking to the mailbox. I'm slowly walking to the front of my house. Three weeks later, I walk into my doctor's office unassisted. He looks at, now I, I went through the process of thinking, right, having to think right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, just to walk because of how the impact, the impact wow. has happened. And he looked at me and goes, I can tell you've been really impacted, but what ha- like, like, what have you been doing? I said, well, I'm preparing for a TEDx talk that I'm planning on giving, and I've been playing my bass. Oh, you've been doing your therapy. That was the first thing he got out of his mouth. He says, you've been, you've already started your therapy. And when they put me on all the machines, they found that, that on the inner side, which is really our brain tissue, which deals with the vestibular, which is right back here, I had lost 86% capability. I only had 14% of the capability of that part of my brain around the balancing. And mm-hmm. that's why it was so bad. Wow. And by playing music, I was able to rewire my brain that three weeks later, I was on stage in Delaware delivering the TEDx talk that's recorded on the TED platform. Wow. And, and that drove me to start to start really assessing all the things that I've done. I was a, I've always been a learner. I've always been someone who's going after mm-hmm. it. But I was like, okay, am I going too hard? Am I, you know, what am I doing? And so on and so forth. And I was a solo entrepreneur. I was a solopreneur. I was doing these, this kind of work for, you know, major corporations that built a lot of partnerships and things like that. So I had a lot of contracts and, and things, but it was just me, you know, again, starting to write some books. That I think by that time I wrote my first book, all right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the other two I hadn't written. And once I started this journey of introspection, really taking care of myself, really thinking about what I'm doing, reaching outside of myself and finding other ex- finding experts who knew about whole brain learning, knew about the brain, knew about the vestibular system, knew about brain gyms, kinesiology, all those things. I did a certification in neuroscience just to learn how to, how to work with myself. With DJ, wow. he passed away, um, um, I would say in December, of uh, I think it was in 2019 or 2000, yeah, no, 2019 she passed away, but she wrote the book Conversational Intelligence. And I, I have a certification on the wall where I spent two years in her program studying neuroscience. Wow. And the process by doing this, I started becoming more productive and more effective when I was now having to take naps, I couldn't ride my bike outside. I couldn't play golf the way I used to. I couldn't, I couldn't do some of the things that I used to do. I went through a divorce and it was just like, what in the world? I, my companies are there. I, that's why I ended up down here. And after going through the divorce, selling the house, two and a half years later, I'm in a position to buy a brand new home, furnish it, have two companies, that are close to eight, doing eight figures of business. I'm on my third book. It's going to be an audio book. And I got all these coaches and programs and people that are saying, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And it's really about how we think 
it's really about understanding energy management. It's really about understanding um, how our thoughts create our world and how we look at our world. It's really about how the condition of our, even the condition of our spine plays a big role in how we look at life. And so by taking all these things into consideration, that's where the productivity intelligence and productivity smarts comes in. Yeah. Because I had, to, I had to really rebuild my life. Yeah. You started from ground up and, exactly. and your, your experience with good mentors and coaches and teachers really, and, and your curiosity really allowed you to go to the places and find the learning that you needed to, to find to teach you what you're doing today. Exactly. Like I've worked with my neuroscientists and they, they've said, uh, you know, neuroscience uh, doctors, and they've said, you know, there's no pill. There's nothing we can give you to yeah. help you address this. But so I do what's called brain gyms, exercises. I do Qigong. I do all these, you know, tapping. I do all these different things that deal to help manage my energy level mm -hmm. and also manage my health and with working out, you know, like I said, yoga and so on, keeping stress at bay. I travel, you know, I've, I've gone to London now, I've gone to the big island of Hawaii, you know, I've traveled. So I'm able to do things, but I have to do them in a measured way. And so one of the reasons I keep, I'm constantly working with my coaches is as I'm going up the ladder of success, I want to make sure I'm not one of those artists that, you know, you don't have the capacity to handle all the good things that are happening to you. So you implode. Yeah. And that sometimes that happens to business owners. Yes. Right. They grow too fast or they, and one of the blessings I've had is that I had an investment in my company and it was guys that I had worked with 20 years ago and that we knew each other really, really well. And there was a lot of trust there. Well, they, they had a big management structure. They've helped me with my management structure. So I have teams that are managing my clients and I can jump in on a call. They send me an email. I send them a text. They may send me something to sign or whatever. But I'm not day to day. Mm -hmm. So it's really a business run, that runs without me. So I can do this. I can write my books. I've already figured out what my fourth book is. I won't tell you right uh, now, but yep. it's going to be based on on on. It's going to be based on productivity smarts. And I'm looking at the top. I'll go ahead and tell you. I'm looking at the top twenty as a top twenty four artists in the last two centuries that have been the most productive to figure yeah. out what did they do to produce 87 albums? That's a lot. Yeah. Of How oh, did they God. Do that? Yeah. Yeah. So much to uncover here. <laughs> it's so great talking with you, Gerald. I just listen. I'm not saying a lot cause I just love listening, but you know, and you, and you, okay, let's just back up a little bit. Yeah. So if you, if we would have been doing this three years ago, I would have been about 50% more of me, not quite 50%, but a good third more of me around. Okay. And what you, what you said is, all, I, I feel good because I get up in the morning a lot earlier than people really even think you should be. And I spend that hour, hour and a half in the morning doing the same things. I'm stretching. I'm working out a little bit. I'm going to meditate. I'm reading. I'm writing. I'm, I'm because I heard this one thing and I don't even remember where I heard it. Someone said that you can either let the day control you. And like you said, that stress just builds on you or, yeah. and, and they likened it to a, an empty soda can. Mm -hmm. They said a Coke can is empty. You can crush it real easy, but if you fill it up with lots of good stuff in the morning and get your body and your blood pumping, how much can you squeeze? Squish a full can. Exactly. And I just use that because I'm simple, right? And I, and I think the difference in your in your morning routine, how much do you think that alone has helped you? It's helped tremendously. Because yeah. here's the thing is, is a lot of the blocks that we have in trying to accomplish our goals is because either one, we're stressed out, right? And then and when we're stressed out, we have all the cortisol, all the adrenaline, all these negative uh, neurochemicals in our bodies. And our, you know, everything that we do is all about energy, right? Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are energy. When we're, when we de-stress the yoga, the works out, work, working out and all the things that we're doing, the meditation, 
we're elevating our, 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 our level of vibration of energy to start attracting the things that we've been planning, the goals that we've been setting. It all, we also put ourselves in a place where we can begin to deal with those negative thoughts or those, those uh, limiting thoughts or sabotaging thoughts that always come. And there's a way, there's, pro, there's processes and ways to address them, to deal with them. And if you're stressed out, you can't hear the intuition. You, you can't, you're not open to being an intuitive person where you hear the, the, the great ideas that are out there. And so because you're stressed and you're thinking stressful thoughts and you attract stressful situations and you attract stressful employees, you attract stressful clients and you're like, my business is so stressful. It's because your business is a reflection of you. Mm -hmm. But when you're at peace, you're focused, you're goal oriented, you are purposeful, then you start attracting all those people and all those people who are like that are attracted to you. They want to be around. And so I'm in a place now in my life where everyone on my team that I work with, I love working with them. So I'm like, I love, I love getting up and going to work. Yeah. You know? and even if it's That's just awesome. having meetings or, or, or doing things and my clients and, and when your clients see that and they see that in your team and they see that in your people, they're going to love coming to your store or to your online presence or to your consulting or to your engagement. They may just keep you around because you're just so much darn fun to keep around yep. because you've got all these great ideas to help them move their business forward. And, and you, you, you're getting into this because I think by, by de-stressing, getting yourself ready for the day, it, it really allows you as a business owner or, or just anyone to yeah. be able to really think more creatively, think on your yeah. feet and be open yeah. to, to more things that, that could be the right solution. Whereas if you're not, you're just so ugh, wound so tight that exactly. it just comes right, goes right by you and you exactly. don't even see it. Exactly. And again, you're, you're, if you're wound up that tight and you're so focused on all the problems and putting out the fires and that's what you're thinking about, well, guess what? You attract all day long. Yeah. The very thing guys. that the very thing that you hate that 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 you're complaining about are the things that you're attracting. And so until you kind of stop the madness and go, okay, let me start planning my day. Let me start just taking a walk. And and here's what I would say. If you're if you're listening and you're uh, and I remember when I was in dealing with this stuff. If someone said, okay, you got to start working out, eating right, blah, 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 and all this, you're like, your amygdala goes, no way, no how. Yeah. You're, you're, like, you're like the dog that doesn't want to go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just put your paws out and you're like, you know, you're going to have to drag me, dude. That's not going to happen. But if you focus on getting 1% better, mm -hmm. just do, you know, I'm going to just put my shoes by the bed so that when I come home, I'm, I, I, they're right there so I can take a walk. Or I'm going to put them by the door or something where it's like you're you're making it easy for yourself to start changing your habits. Because if you do too much by human nature, by who we are, and this little thing in our brains called the amygdala, right? As soon as we hear change, it goes, no, no, I'm not going to change. No, no, you're not, no, no, don't touch that. And it, it because it wants to protect you. Mm -hmm. And so let it do its job. But if you give it 1% of something to change, that's not too bad. We can do that. Yeah. And then you keep increasing it by doing the 1%. And it's like, oh, we're doing, we're, and it doesn't realize, and you don't realize how much you've changed because you've just focused on getting 1% better. Yeah. Yeah. So, my original topic for our, for our title for this today was building sustainable, high performing teams. And I think we've covered a lot of that because, yeah. because honestly, you can't have a high performing team if everybody is wound like that. I mean, they have to be in sync. You know, you talked about the things about, I talked about music and being an ensemble. They have to be in sync, but they can't just like in music, you can't have somebody worrying about, am I playing right? Am I, you know, cause that tense. Yeah destroys the, the the fluidity of the music yes and um so as you're in helping helping these companies helping these leaders really 
talk about how do we how do we start to look at this with our people and you know because we do have you know like you said in large companies people are under pressure you didn't make your 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 quarterly profits even yeah. in a small company they might be having having a lot of trouble so what are some practical things that people can really do to as leaders to help themselves and their teams to really change the way they're approaching this i'm glad you asked that because um, one, I'll say this, and this is not just promoting the book, but but it's, it, this is in the book. Okay. At the end of the book, I have a whole implementation strategy around everything that's being taught. And I didn't read the book and we didn't talk about this. I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's in the back of the book. And here's the, here's the secret of it. It actually came from a major law firm, like 3,000 person law firm in the D.C. area. Yeah. That's one of the top, I would say, in the top 20 law firms. I worked there for about, if you look at my profile, you see who they are. I worked there for four years. They were having a lot of these problems when I came mm -hmm. in. I had been a consultant for 20-something years before I got there. So when I came in, I, I went, I, and it was around 2008 where the market was crashing and everything was kind of crazy. Yeah. So I came out of consulting and worked for them for about four and a half years. It was the Ivy League law firm. I felt like I was getting a PhD in, in understanding professional service organizations. Yeah, and really, it was a, it was an amazing opportunity for me to learn. But what I brought to the table was knowing how to help even those organizations slowly transform. And you have to think about it as that's an ocean liner. So yes. when an ocean liner gets stuck, what happens? You get a lot of little tugboats right? A lot of little tugboats and they begin to push it to where it can now crank up the motion and go start going. And so my tugboats for that firm were things like um, the four-legged stool process for training. Executive C-level folks, if they're learning about project execution, they don't want to sit in a class. Mm -hmm. And they want, they want you to come and talk to them as, as, as who they are smart, accomplished, you know, very, very accomplished people. And so I did a one hour workshop for the senior team in New York using their language and saying, these are the six things that you need to know about what we're going to be doing. And you need to know these because you're going to have to sign every charter that's in your department because you're the executive sponsor. So then I knew the managers didn't want to come to training. So I created training with my team and I had them go sit with the managers at their desk and slowly train them on a monthly basis on the new process. Mm -hmm. For everyone else, I created a, a like a two hour training that I trained the trainers on and we trained all 3000 people globally. It was five countries, 14 offices. They trained everyone globally. I let them do the training. I would come in afterwards and answer anybody's questions during the training. And a lot of the training was in virtual settings. For the project managers, I did lunch and learns. Mm -hmm. I would go to their I would go to their project meetings and help them out. But then once a week, I took them through the the PMBOK. I took them through my training, and I slowly started handing out. Okay, here's what a here's what a charter looks like. We discussed it, we reviewed it. Now we now we're going to implement it. Everyone's going to now have a charter. This is what a status report looks like. Now we're going to start using status reports. And so I so by doing that, it literally turned the tide of the organization. They were barely getting, let's say, 12, 15 projects done a year because they didn't have you didn't have a deadline. You didn't have a date. You didn't have a charter. So people just keep adding things to it. Mm -hmm. said, this is what a project is, is a temporary activity for the beginning and the end. We started completing 60 and 70 and 80 projects a year. All that backlog of, 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 of demand that they wanted. We need this system. We need this. all that start flowing through the funnel. Then I got them into portfolio management where they could say, hey, we need to look at this. Where's this going in the industry? They got this technology. We have you have discovery tools. We have this. How can we use? Are we using the best ones? Or you know, do we have constrained resources? Who's our constraint? You know, the constrained resource for was for us. It was the it was the um the, the legal group. Who uh, yeah. for for contracts within the IT department? They were the they were the Herbie. They were the, they were the yeah. Herbie 
of that department. And when we, I, when I exposed that and said, this is the problem, we brought somebody in and we had two herpes. So now we could, we'd increase the throughput of getting mm -hmm. the project done. So now we can, do, and then we brought in additional consultants who are project managers, but we had a system and a process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so there are things, and another thing that I did with um, a depart the Department of Transportation, um, that became that was like a big program, multiple projects over time, and mm -hmm. over time we started, you know, changing members out. And I had one time where we changed some members out. I had someone leave the team, and a couple of managers just kind of gave us people. They didn't know the project. They didn't know how critical it was and what was happening with it. So I, I'm like, okay, we got to squelch this and pull it together. So what I ended up doing was doing something I learned from D. Jacob in the book called Conversational Intelligence. Get the book. It's an amazing book. Conversational Intelligence. Got and it. she has a prog She has a, a, a framework in there, an exercise called Rules of Engagement. And if you have a team that's not performing right, you sit down with them, you get them to leave their computers outside the room, you give them sticky notes, and you say, okay, we're all going to sit down and I want you to write down eight things or attributes of teams that you worked on that were your favorite teams. What did they do? Why would that? Why was that your favorite team? Oh, they were. There was a lot of integrity. Oh, we had we 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 had fun. We went out for dinner. Oh, um, we did this and we did that. Okay, great. So you know, can you get up and put yours on the wall? So that person gets up. Then Miss, can you get up and put yours on the wall? And if you if the same word is there, put yours on top of that one. We're basically kind of creating an infinity diamond, mm -hmm. right? Yep. As we did that, they started looking like, oh my goodness, we have so much more in common than we have that than not. And then I said, well, what, what do you guys notice? We all really like the same things. We want the same. We, we want the same experience. I said, no, we have a couple of outliers. Why is that important to you? Why is that important to you? Why is that? And so. People started being heard. They started being listened to. Remember, what do you what do you do as a musician? You have to listen. listen. You got to listen to the other musicians. You got to you got to make sure everybody's in tune. You got to tune the the instrument and tune the band, right? Mm -hmm. And when everyone felt heard and listened to and saw that we were all on the same page and had the same values, that team clicked. Yeah, never had that's never, never had a problem again with it. That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, Gerald, this is this has been such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. It's just a, a, a just a blessing to be able to talk to you today because it you have shared so much, and I'm so excited because I haven't read your third book yet because you just released it two days ago. Yes, but it but will Warren. be coming. Yeah. It will be coming to my house. Uh, and you said it's out on on uh, Audible pretty soon too, yeah, or an audio book. It'll be on audio in, in about four weeks or so. Yeah, because that's that's my that's my jam. Because uh, I get out to nature and and I walk a long ways and listen to books. But it has been such a pleasure. And and today here talking about, um, you know, we we're talking about <laughs> building high performing sustainable teams, uh, sustainably high performing teams. We got Gerald Leonard here from the, the Leonard Productivity Intelligence Institute. Oh, I said it right. I didn't look. I had to go back and look at my notes. But <laughs> man, man, it's so good to get to talk to you, sir, because it's you. You are such a such a gift, such a gift that you, I can just imagine being in and learning from you in, in a situation. And I, I know the listeners have have, have enjoyed this. I want to. Thank all the listeners that took the time to put a comment in. We got Muhammad and and we've got Edward and Curtis that were in here. And I got someone else. I can't, I, can't, I can't, don't know who it is, but um, thanks so much for all your comments and everyone's listened. But Gerald, thanks again. Uh, I, how can, if someone says, listen, I need Gerald to come and talk to my team. Is the best way to go to your website? What's the best way to get a hold? Well, I have to actually, we've actually created a page specifically for your listeners. And if All you right. go to Productivity Intelligence Institute forward slash FOB, face of business. Very so good. Productivity Intelligence Institute forward slash FOB. They, there's, there's some um, workbooks. There's a awesome. um, evaluation guide. 
And if someone wants to have a call with me, uh, there's a link to my calendar. Um, awesome. uh, there's also uh, down below some information about the um, the book and that my email and my, my LinkedIn profile. So if you want to reach out to me, you can go to that page and everything that your listeners will need to learn about me, they can go there and they'll see the site and the podcast and everything else on that, on that site. Well, Gerald, thank you so much. And I, I tell you, I want to tell you right now, I want to have you back again because I think that we we just scratch the surface on the, some of this stuff because we didn't even start talking about AI and productivity and how that's right. gonna. Oh God, man! Yeah, I had a call, I had a call this morning with a gentleman in, in the UK who who whose company is all about AI. We did a we did a, 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 a oh. and um, there's some great stuff there. Incredible. Well, thanks so much, Gerald. And hang out just for a moment. I'm going to say yeah. goodbye to everyone else. We're going to wrap up. Thanks everyone for being here again on the Faces of Business. We appreciate you. Stop by, drop your comments, let us know where you're listening from. We'll be back again next week with more interesting and incredible guests. See y'all later.